Hey everybody, Jonah here. Welcome back to another video uh, during this severe weather awareness week for 2024. Today's big focus is going to be on understanding other hazards that often accompany severe weather. Um, and there's quite a few of them that occur as a result of or even during or shortly after and in the days leading up to severe weather events. And being aware of these hazards um, can help protect you help you prepare for severe weather um, and reduce your risks of being a victim of some of these hazards. <clears throat> so as I said, there's several hazards. Um, flash flooding and lightning are the two biggest ones that we see occurring during the storm. Um, but storm damage can certainly occur during any severe storms. Um, we have the threat of additional severe storms to come in behind a line or a cell that has already um, impacted an area. Power outages are obviously a concern, especially when those power outages become prolonged or continue for several days. And then dangerous heat as well often accompanies severe weather. And I mentioned this on Sunday, but last year during August, ahead of the August 24th uh, tornado event across lower Michigan, uh, we did see um, a couple of days where we had extreme heat across the area, um, excessive heat, I should say, across the area, where we had surface temperatures up around and even over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's talk about flooding, and today we're specifically going to talk about flash flooding. Uh, and the difference between flooding and flash flooding is that flash flooding is rapid onset. It occurs in as little as a few minutes to up to three hours, uh, whereas flooding is occurs over a much longer um, uh, time frame, more than three hours and up to several weeks as well. And so the biggest thing that sets those apart is that time frame. And flash flooding is made more dangerous because there is less time to prepare and react to potential uh, damage and life safety impacts from that flash flooding. So the biggest thing we can do for flash flooding is get to higher ground, um, get out of the areas that are subject to flooding either by driving to an area of higher terrain or by getting into the upper levels of a building, be it a home or a business. Uh, you definitely want to be on the highest floor that you can possibly get to and if that floor becomes unsafe you want to get up on the roof and attempt to call 911 and this graphic is a little bit extreme for the stuff we typically see in Michigan typically we see flooding impacts that are much less severe than this but especially if you uh, live in a flood prone area along a river uh, or a creek in a low-lying area, uh, someplace like that, you may be somewhat familiar with flooding like this that can intrude on the lower levels of your home and can carry away your vehicles, etc. Um, so it's definitely something good to talk about, and we'll discuss this in more detail uh, tomorrow as we wrap up Severe Weather Awareness Week by talking about where you should be at during severe weather. Uh, very quickly, um, we see the most flood-related deaths in vehicles as a result of motorists trying to drive through flooded roadways. Um, and so I just want to quickly uh, flash this graphic up. Um, and the, the slogan is, when flooded, turn around, don't drown. You really don't ever know how deep that flood water is that's over the roadway. Um, it could be an inch, it could be several feet in depth, especially if the roadway is washed out underneath it. You just don't know, and especially at night, it can be very difficult to tell how deep that water is. As little as 12 inches of moving water can carry away a small car, and is around 18 inches can carry away even larger vehicles like SUVs and trucks. So, um, And then very similarly to... Um, severe thunderstorm warnings and tornado warnings. There are sort of three different levels of flash flood warnings. And the basic um, premise here is that you need to get to higher ground uh, and you need to avoid driving through flooded roadways. Um, 
these occur from rainfall or snowmelt or a combination of both, or they can also be issued when dam failure occurs. Um, so the generalized idea is getting to higher ground. Um, when we see a considerable tag, um, the damage caused by flooding can be a little bit more significant um, to cars and homes and businesses. And then once we get to this emergency, this flash flood emergency um, tag here, we see catastrophic flash flooding. And that occurs not just in low-lying areas, but across the entire warned area. So we need to get to higher ground. We're expecting additional rainfall or snow, or snow melt, excuse me. Um, so both of those things are expected, whereas they're just sort of possible with these other two. Um, there's going to be more water coming into the already flooded areas. So we definitely need to be seeking higher ground. It's a life-threatening situation. And again, catastrophic damage from the flooding uh, to vehicles, homes, businesses uh, is expected across the entire warned area. So uh, get to higher ground to protect your life. So let's talk about nature's leading cause of death. And that is, of course, lightning. Uh, lightning is hotter than the surface of the sun. It can reach temperatures of up to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, the risk, aside from the crazy amount of heat there, is of course the electricity component of it uh, and the ability to cause the electrocution. So um, the general rule of thumb here, and we'll see this phrase repeated throughout this little segment here, is when thunder roars, go indoors. Um, we want to stop all outdoor activities, seek shelter in a substantial building or a hard-topped vehicle um, if there's not a building available. And I'll use the example of a, of a baseball dugout on a baseball field. That may not necessarily be a substantial shelter, um, especially if that dugout is topped with uh, sheet metal like many are. Um, that's definitely not necessarily a safe place to be during a lightning storm. So if you hear thunder or you see lightning, you want to move indoors or into a hard-topped vehicle uh, to protect you from lightning. And then we need to wait 30 minutes minimum uh, after the last lightning strike or rumble of thunder to resume activities. Um, and so this just is a little bit of statistics. 40% of lightning fatalities occurred during soccer. 27% during golf, 10% uh, during baseball, 3% during football. A majority of lightning-related deaths actually occur while fishing or boating um, and while farming. So these are for sports, but <clears throat> lightning also causes death uh, in several other areas uh, of outdoor activity as well, specifically fishing or boating as well as farming. So let's talk about um, additional severe weather occurring after uh, an area has already been impacted. So many times, especially in Michigan, um, during severe weather events, we'll see uh, storms forming chains or what's um, technically called training of storms. So they'll chain together and they'll subject areas that have already been impacted by severe weather with additional severe weather or additional thunderstorm threats. Um, and so lightning um, is a big concern with storms that are moving out of those areas as well as from the storms that are moving into those same areas. Um, and then we definitely need to have this plan or this idea in the back of our heads of what if there's a forecast for multiple rounds of severe weather um, during the day and during the morning round, for example, um, your home is unfortunately hit by a tornado and is no longer safe to shelter in. Where are you going to go for the afternoon round of severe thunderstorms that may come through the area? So always be thinking about that um, during Severe Weather Awareness Week. Uh, think about creating a plan of where you may go if that were to happen to you. Um, and then power outages, um, power outages after a storm, the biggest thing we see is people using candles. 
um, and not using generators safely. So we want to use flashlights and have backup batteries for those flashlights. You know, yesterday we talked about having an emergency kit. Definitely want to um, use flashlights rather than candles after um, or during a power outage, I should say. Um, and it says this will avoid the risk of fire. And that's certainly true. Candles are one of the leading causes of fires uh, in the United States. And we definitely uh, need to avoid using those um, after severe weather. Use a flashlight. They're great. Generator safety. Um, we need to use generators appropriately. And that means following the manufacturer's instructions, keeping them in well-ventilated areas, um, not using them inside, and that includes in your garage. Keep them in well-ventilated areas um, and make sure that they're not jerry-rigged or uh, redneck-rigged in any way. Follow those manufacturer specifications um, and use them appropriately. And then we need to be careful with food and water, especially if you don't have a generator that powers your refrigerator and freezer. Um, definitely be keeping an eye on those temperatures. We don't want to have a foodborne illness situation uh, on top of damage from severe weather. That's just not a good combo. And we'll talk more about this um, as we dive into dangerous heat, but um, ahead of or after severe weather and we still have dangerous heat um, like we did last year in August, um, these are some tips that can help keep you cool. Um, and we need to be checking on the elderly uh, and the other vulnerable populations um, when we are faced with power outages and just dangerous heat in general. And then, of course, storm damage uh, is a big thing with severe weather, um, and it can occur in, in, in several different ways. Down power lines is probably the biggest one. Um, if you see a downed power line, first of all, avoid it. Stay away from it. Never assume that it's safe to touch. Always plan on it being energized and having the potential to cause electrocution or significant injury. Um, call 911 and Consumers Energy to report it. Get it taken care of before you attempt to interact with it. Um, we saw last year uh, residents were out in their yard after the August 24th tornadoes. Um, trying to clean up and the trees that they were grabbing had power lines wrapped through it. You just need to be very careful after storms and tornadoes especially that have the ability to um, blow debris across the area, get entangled with power lines, bring those power lines down, um, and then appear seemingly harmless on the ground as a branch, but it actually has a power line wrapped through it that may be energized. So definitely a concern. Always call 911 um, to report those power lines that are down. Be situationally aware when you're outside cleaning up after a storm. Always have your head on a swivel looking for those potential hazards. Natural gas leaks, of course, can occur, especially after a tornado. Uh, we can see sheared off gas meters, um, broken gas mains, all sort of things. And of course, those pose a pretty significant fire and explosion risk. Um, so always avoid smoking, using matches, using lighters, uh, and burning storm debris in a storm damage area. Um, if you smell natural gas or hear hissing from a home, definitely call 911 and get that addressed. Um, your local fire department and DT Energy will respond and get that addressed in whatever capacity is needed. Um, if you're ever in doubt, definitely go ahead and call. Uh, there's no harm in having something checked out. Fires in of themselves can be a risk after severe weather. Um, lightning can cause wildfires. Lightning can start homes on fire and other buildings, trees. And then of course there's that risk of candles getting knocked over when used during power outages. Again, the use of candles should be avoided. Sharp objects, we're looking at nails, rebarb, uh, pieces of sheet metal and corrugated metal, broken branches, all kinds of sharp objects and other storm debris may exist um, and will probably exist in an area that's been impacted by significant severe weather and or a tornado. 
Uh, and then this last one is um, not super prevalent, uh, but looting, of course, can be a problem as well. Um, typically, within a few hours of a severe weather event, there's lots of law enforcement and emergency management present in an area, but of course, looting can still occur. So do the best you can to secure your property, secure your valuables, um, take them to a, a family member's house, put them in storage temporarily. Whatever you can do to secure your valuables after a storm is a great idea. Remember to avoid pushing yourself. Exertion is a big problem we see after um, severe weather as people are outside cleaning up, especially in the heat. Um, we need to stay hydrated, light fitting clothing, or I'm sorry, loose fitting clothing, um, taking breaks, using air conditioning, and staying hydrated are a huge, um, huge tip that we can not stress enough. Um, again, August last year, we saw several days of significant heat um, ahead of, and I think even following the August 24th tornado event. So be very careful when you're outside working after severe weather um, and be careful with chainsaws as well, obviously. Moving into extreme heat or what's better known as excessive heat, technically. Um, excessive heat is any heat that is over 95 degrees. Heat index is over 95 degrees, I believe or any actual temperature over 100 degrees. Um, and the hazards we see here are obviously the ability for heat to impact the vulnerable populations, dehydration, heat exhaustion, and even heat stroke. Um, and so these are some tips to help alleviate that threat and to keep you safe from that threat. Always be checking in on your neighbors and your family members during extreme heat. Again, staying indoors, drinking water, avoid alcohol, um, checking in on the vulnerable. And then again, if you have to go outside, especially if you're outside working, um, cleaning up after a storm, for example, try to do it in the early day or in the evening as the sun starts to set or as the sun has not had time to really heat up the surface yet um, and dress in light colored, loose fitting clothing. And this is an excessive heat watch. The difference between an excessive heat watch and an excessive heat warning. Um, these will be issued um, in conjunction with heat advisories uh, ahead of excessive heat. And these are just um, giving tips and tricks about how to stay healthy during uh, excessive heat. So again, we talked about this yesterday, but one of the hazards after severe weather is not having a reliable source of weather information, especially if we're looking at uh, multiple rounds of severe storms being possible. Have multiple ways to get those warnings, have backups, have redundancies um, in case one of your primary methods of receiving weather information is no longer available. Remember, we may be without power, uh, we may be without internet, definitely have a NOAA weather radio. These are the best things um, that you can have to alert yourself to hazardous weather. They're battery powered, they don't require uh, internet, and they're relatively cheap. Uh, so that's going to wrap up today. Tomorrow we're going to finish Severe Weather Awareness Week by talking about um, where you should be during severe weather. So we're looking forward to that. And we hope you all enjoyed today's video on other hazards that often accompany severe weather.